Tuesday down here in Southern Michigan, 55 degrees. I liked it and I liked it a lot. I want summer to come really bad. In fact, I talked to Mother Nature the other day. I said, Mom, I said, hey, bring on the summer early. I won't complain about the heat. I won't complain about the humidity, the sun in my eyes. The summer will be different. <laughs> and to celebrate, the early summer, we hope, we're going to take you tubing down a river. Hey, this is an ideal summer activity. We're going to talk to DNR Director K.L. Cool, his first time on this show, and a lot more. Stay tuned. We're going to celebrate the early coming of summer here on The Practical Sportsman. Wading in a stream is one way to fish if you don't have a boat. Your main investment is a good pair of waders, and the only other thing you need is a river or a lake that has a firm bottom that isn't weedy or slippery or doesn't have any hidden holes that are deeper than your waders. Using an inner tube called a belly boat is a step up, but last summer we tried a step up from belly boats. The guys who make these call them float tubes, and they're mostly air. Oh, heck. Heck. This is cinchy. I like this. A float tube is lightweight, 10 pounds maybe, some heavy-duty canvas, some aluminum tubing, and industrial plastic. You have a one-man boat that comes apart and can fit in any car. Now, this is not an inner tube. It's a boat. Get my fishing rods ready to go. Like a lot of outdoor gear, you could customize this with rod holders, pouches, a cooler. Some of these options are built in, but there's a lot you could add depending on what kind of fishing gear you had and what you wanted to do. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Primo. Boy, this thing really slides easy. If you've ever tried to turn a canoe around by yourself, even without a wind from the side trying to make your life miserable, you'd appreciate how easy it is to turn a float tube. Maneuverable. Very maneuverable and comfortable. Oh, let's go fishing, guys. <laughs> now, the guys I'm talking to are the guys who design and make these tubes. Jim Swanson in the back, Ron Allen in the front, they're J and R, and their little business is J and R float tubes. And you can see how big their float tubes are getting. Last year they came out with a two-man duck boat. You can put a little outboard motor on, but this is not how they started. A few years ago they fished from inner tubes with canvas straps for seats. With those original belly boats, you actually sit in the water. The inner tube is under your armpits, and you move the tube by kicking your feet. And that's where the swim fins come in. Now, maneuvering a round inner tube like that is not as easy as it sounds. I mean, it works, it's cheap, but it does have its problems. So the first improvement that J&R made uh, on the round inner tube concept was to make the tubes long, straight cylinders, so there's actually a, a front and a back with a real seat. Then they took the seat and put it above the water made the tubes a little longer and added a pair of oars. And to talk to these guys, you'd think that their float tubes were the best invention since sliced bread. Well, an inner tube, you know, just like a donut, it's, it has no stability. You know, any side you add weight to, the other sides become light. Um, with the pontoon design, the wind doesn't blow you around like it does in a round boat. Um, you don't have a problem with it wearing out the knees of your waders, because normally in a round boat, your legs rub everything. Sets you a little higher out of the water, makes it more comfortable to fish. And also, going, getting rid of the inner tube eliminates most of the weight. You go to a nice high quality vinyl liner or PVC, and you can drop most of your weight. You go to an aluminum frame, and you've got something that weighs in it, you know, 10 pounds. Easy to carry, easy to break down, easy to store in the wintertime. And you're not constantly, you know, fighting the water and fighting the wind and everything else. So. Hmm. But you wear fins and uh, waders when you use that? Yeah, in, in your small boats, um, what was originally called belly boating or float tubing, yeah, you wore fins and, you know, people used everything from cheap scuba diving fins to now you have high dollar, you know, $150 force fins. Turn, you know, but you've gone from the fins to the oars. I mean, you started making a boat. You, 
Yeah. You, you lost grip on the belly boat thing. Well, we gained speed. We, we found that we had so much fun fishing in a lightweight boat that we could just, you know, you decide at 9 o'clock at night you want to go fishing or 6 o'clock in the morning, you don't have to go load up the boat on the trailer, spend a half an hour getting out of the driveway and another half hour getting on the water. You grab your boat, you throw it in the truck, you bomb on down to the lake, you throw it in the water. Well, now you want to hit a bigger lake and the fish are always biting on the other side. It's a long way to kick when you're not doing any fishing. So you come out with a boat that's got the oars on it and you can really move. I mean, you can, you know, you can now run a trolling motor with them. So, hmm. you know, you got a lightweight boat, lightweight oars. You move right over to where you want to fish, put your feet back down, and go back to the regular way of fishing. This is unruly. Look at that, northern pike. Oh. Now, this is going to be interesting. Very interesting. Oh, there's a nut. I don't think he's ready to come in yet. Very Will frankly. What? No, that's okay, I'll get him, but he's just not tired yet. And he's smiling a lot. There we go. That's good. Take the hook right out. Look at that. Hey, this is all right. Yeah. Wow. What do you think of that? It's pretty cool. If you've ever handled a northern pike, you understand all my hand washing. If you haven't handled a northern pike, don't worry about it. It's just a part of the charm of these fish. But actually, there's other fish in this river, too. Whoa! This is a smallmouth, too, and it's a decent one. Yeah. That's why I come out of it. I started to go through it and then seen what I was going in, and I decided, okay. no, that's... See, Johnny, I'm not funning you here. Whoa! Huh? Huh? Oh. You get right close to the action in this boat. Probably gonna get off. No. Come on, Johnny. You know who I am? <laughs> Yeah, look at that. Hey, that would almost be a keeper, I think. Well, I caught his... You caught his... Kid. Yeah, that's pretty decent. Thirteen and a half. Pretty good. You got a measuring thing on the front of your boat. Oh, it... No, not on this one. Oh. Look how they sit right there. You hold them that way. That never fails to impress me. Set them in the water and... Oh! Oh, a big thank you it gave me. You guys went by and I got a hit right underneath your big Oh yeah? Oh yeah, they're in here. Yeah, it's a nice hole. That's why I'm stopping. This river is generally a couple feet deep, but the hole Ron is talking about is five or six feet. Bigger fish are either in or around that hole. Now, I hooked a fish up near shore that got tangled in a sunken tree, but I worked it loose. Oh, it's a bass. It's a bass. It's a smallmouth, huh? Yep. It's a nice one. Oh, man. It's a porker. Look at that. Oh, this is too cool. Too cool. I don't think he's ready. He is not ready by any stretch. Oh, I'm in the trees here. Boy, that's a good one. I think this little twister tail is a dandy bait. <laughs> sure is versatile. Yeah, that's a nice one. Look at this. Huh? Holy smokes. They're getting bigger every time. Man, that one pulled the drag. There are a lot of rivers in this state that are full of smallmouth bass, rivers that are around where you live, and not many people fish them. Now that's a legal size. That was a dandy one. There, I'll push you back and let her go. Oh, 
Oh man, I knew he was going to do that. I let him go the other direction. Now, why do I toss this bass back? Well, I was tempted to keep it because smallmouth bass are terrific eating. But bass are fun to catch, and they can be caught time and time again. Now, this river, like most Michigan lakes and streams, has other fish, panfish, catfish, even walleye, that I wouldn't toss back, and you never know when you're going to catch them. Yeah, this is a good one. This hadn't even shown itself yet. Oh, he threw in and latched onto my fish, huh? Yep. Is that a walleye? Is this a walleye? Is this a walleye? Look at this. This is a walleye. Ooh. Oh boy. Oh boy. What do I what do you see here? I see two fillets. That's a keeper. Huh? Yeah, he hit pretty hard, but all he did was hit my worm. Hey, I, I like this. Now this walleye. It's not going back, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, we'll, we'll measure just Can I measure them up here? Yeah. It's fun. important to know what the size limits are for the body of water you're fishing. And it's important to have a measuring tape, too. There's 15 there. That's, oh, right, Start from the, yeah. right from there. We're over 15, so, so we've got it covered. We've got it covered. Now, what do we do with the, uh, the fish? Of course, I don't have a stringer. And I'm not putting it in my pocket, Mr. Jim. <laughs> now, this happens far more often than most anglers like to admit. Stringers at home, stringers in the garage, maybe even a stringer in the truck back at the ramp. So the old practical side of a sportsman comes out using a piece of anchor rope. There we go. All right. Well, I've got uh, smallmouth, northern pike, and illegal walleye. In fact, the legal, I don't know if that pike was legal or not. Probably wasn't, but bass and the walleye were. Now, back in. You know, rivers like this flow every which way in this state, and most rivers have far more fish than most people think. Every now and then, uh, you'll see somebody waiting, and you'll see a few canoeists from time to time, and quite a few people fish from shore. But the point is, these rivers, by and large, have plenty of elbow room. And there's lots of lakes and ponds that you can fish, too. Now, a small aluminum boat or canoe can get you onto these waters. You don't need an outboard motor. You don't need a landing net or even a measuring tape. Just a fishing rod, maybe a sandwich and some sunblock. I tell you, there's no better way to spend a summer day. I'm coming. Oh, yes. I like it. I like it. Johnny, I promise, if I can do that again this month, I'll appreciate it a lot more than I did then. Well, you look good out there. You had your shorts on. I know it. Now, people are going to have people are going to have questions. Uh, one question they're going to have is, how much are those suckers? Mm -hmm. They're about uh, two hundred and fifty bucks for that little one that you kick with. To the deluxe about, model. Yeah, that, that one I was using is about seven hundred bucks, and then fifteen hundred bucks for that big mm -hmm. double Duck one that boat. you were in. Yep. They're also going to ask, where were we fishing? And you're going to tell them exactly where. <laughs> yes! <laughs> no. Yes! It's right here. Get a map book of all the Michigan counties. All of our fishing spots are in here. Now, I don't want to go back fishing for walleye in That's that right. hole and find it. Elbow Catching the elbow. walleye, that did it. Yes, that did it. I want to go back there. But that's on the Grand River. We'll, we'll tell you that much. And we got more to show, too, of putting it together and all the other stuff later we on. We do. We're going to show you how, you know, assembling them and, mm -hmm. and so on. Measuring that fish. You know that walleye? Uh -huh. We had to measure. I didn't have the measuring tape there. Um, how do you? How would you go about measuring the snow depth if you were a hunter? <laughs> if you were an elk hunter specifically, we learned this at last year's banquet. Yeah. Do we just want to let the guy? I think we'll let him explain it. Yeah, it's not used with the measuring tape. At last year's hunting awards banquet, Jim Ozentoski from Bad Axe told us how he got a trophy six by seven elk in the deep snow. Of course, everybody wants to know, how deep was it? It was uh, waist deep, uh, walked about four miles, noodle deep, and uh, it was a tough one. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, we have a question here. What is noodle deep? 
Well, as you can see, I got pretty short legs. It was great. Yep. Okay. The guy, he had snowshoes, and he's waving for me to keep coming, and I couldn't go. I was like I had two little stubbies. I couldn't keep up to him. Finally, we caught up and uh, pretty much did the job. I guess. Well, that's a new one, uh, Jim. We're, uh, I know one thing, we'll be using that phrase quite a bit in the coming year. <laughs> Can't you hear it now, Johnny? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Who is K.L. Cool? Where'd you come from? Well, there have been a lot of answers to that one, but I, I came off of the prairies. I guess I'd call myself a prairie person. That means the Dakotas? Yeah. Yeah. And your background is, is not the traditional background of DNR directors we've had, is it? Perhaps not. I, uh, I started in the profession having uh, both a bachelor's and a master's degree in uh, fish and wildlife management. Wildlife management was the course title of the master's degree and uh, spent a little time in the U.S. Army, and when I returned home, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be hired as a game warden. Now, mm -hmm. Here they call them conservation officers, but you've just been to Montana not too long ago, and I understand there's still game wardens out there. So that was my first introduction into the field, was uh, I served for several years in a game warden, then I was a research biologist, a, and spent uh, a fair amount of time on white-tailed deer, and waterfowl, and, and then on upland birds, especially pheasants, and moved from there into the policy end of the business in South Dakota with an invitation by the department director to become a position called public affairs officer, and then the, uh, the secretary's assistant. The director in South Dakota is called the secretary, and I served as his special assistant. And after a few years of that, moved into the director of the wildlife division, which would really be more encompassing than the wildlife division here, where George Burgoyne deals pretty specifically with wildlife management. In South Dakota, wildlife is an all-encompassing word. It includes law enforcement, fisheries, wildlife, administration, federal aid administration, so it has much broader implications. So in many ways, uh, that was the biggest of the divisions in the department. It pretty much represents the DNR that we have here today. Why would you want to come here? I mean, this has been a battle zone for the past 15, 20 years with the environment. We've had DNR directors, conservation department directors who have had heart attacks and passed away on the job. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, billed as the easiest conservation job in the country. I think it's the best, and if it isn't, it can be. Uh, you know, my travels uh, took me across those great prairies in terms of a career path. And then I spent four years in Montana, and that's really what probably laid my foundation for coming here. Not only the resource management and the issues that were involved in, in, uh, in that state, but the opportunity to learn the basic administration and foundation that I needed to do this job successfully. Well, do they fuss and fight out in those other states? Yeah. The way we do here? Uh, actually, Montana is a little more adept at fussing and fighting than they are even here is in that Michigan. Right? Yeah, that, that was a good one. Huh. And I spent three uh, pretty stable years in North Dakota as the director of the department. And as you moved east into North Dakota, that's uh, a small, older organization. I think we brought some pretty new and progressive ideas. It was in North Dakota that I got to test some new management philosophies and ones that we're in fact trying to implement here. They dealt with a team uh, approach to decision making that produced both historical foundation and certainly uh, produced an opportunity to take a broader perspective than, than what uh, some of our division chiefs might call the silos they're in and then project that into informed decisions for the department. So we've got a very different decision-making process in the DNR today than, than they had a year ago. 
So what do you, what do you think? <laughs> I was just going to say, what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> That's what everybody's sitting out there in the audience. What do you think? Haven't he, heard the guy talk He's yet. got a big vision of Michigan in the future here. He does. He has, uh, frankly, he's not cut from the same cloth as many of the bureaucrats. Absolutely not. Or he doesn't appear to be. I don't, but I trust him. I I think I do. I, yeah, I mean, he, you know, it's been very interesting mm -hmm. talking with the new DNR director. We will have him on more in the future mm -hmm. to talk about his recipe for the DNR. That's right. For a model, a model for... Well, I don't recipe. Wanna... Recipe is the buzzword, man. Okay. You know why? Because that's you ought to lead into what we're going to do next. That's okay. right. <laughs> Luana Helmick from Mason has a way of fricasseeing rabbit that is scrumptious. Cut up two rabbits into serving size pieces, lightly brown a jar of pearl onions in butter, set them aside until the end, then you brown the rabbit pieces. Now, when all the rabbit is browned, sprinkle them with a tablespoon of flour over those rabbit pieces, and you cook that until the juice is sort of straw-colored. Then add a cup of white wine, a cup of chicken stock, some bacon, garlic, parsley, thyme, a bay leaf, and salt and pepper, and cook for 15 minutes. Then you stir in the other half of the chicken stock and some flour. Put all of this in a heavy casserole dish and cook at 350 for an hour. Then you add the onions and a pound of mushrooms. Bake another 15 minutes. It's called fricassee a rabbit, a good winter dish. It's a porker. Look at that. Oh, this is too cool. Too cool. I don't think he's ready. He is not ready by any stretch. Oh, I'm in the trees here. Boy, that's a good one. 